All right, Joshua chapter 2 is where we're going to start. Boy, we're not making, uh, we're not rapidly going through Joshua. I'll, I'll say that, but that's okay. We'll eventually, we're going to take a big jump here at, at some, one point. We're not going to necessarily study every little war that they have or battle that they have. We're going to hit some of the higher points, but today we're going to talk about this scarlet cord and the life of Rahab. Um, it's an interesting story to say the least and um, very thought-provoking depending on uh, how you take a stance for or against lying. And uh, so we're going to talk about this. I probably won't answer every question, but I want to talk about, we're not, it's not really even about Rahab. It's not. I mean, she's the main character of the story here, but um, I've heard a lot of interesting conversations around the life of Rahab, especially focused on the fact that she lied. People usually take sides and try to debate, was she right? Was she wrong? Is it okay because she was lying to a whole bunch of pagans, therefore it's okay? You know, she just kind of bent the truth, right? It was a little, uh, it saved lives. There are lots of ends justifying the means. I'm not, uh, and uh, so if you want to know my opinion, I think she was wrong to lie, but at the same time, the Lord used it. And uh, the Lord can use sinful people and their sinful practices. And that's actually kind of the point. Right? It's not so much about Rahab lying or not lying. Um, I'll, I'll add this. The reason she had to lie was because the spies were not very good spies. Right? They, get caught, they got caught right away. And if it wasn't for Rahab, they, they, they would have been uh, dead. And so, uh, but the, gen, the ends do not justify the means here. And this is interesting to me because it's not really the purpose of the passage. The purpose of this passage is God's redemption of a sinner. And we certainly see and hear about the sin of Rahab. And so the story is one of faith in spite of sin and in spite of failure. In fact, the story even centers around failure, as I said. Uh, Israel is commanded to wait. I mean, this is what they've been doing, waiting this whole 39 years they've been waiting, and now they're at the edge. They're on the eastern side of the sea, or of uh, the Jordan River, and God says, wait three more days, and then you'll pass over. And Joshua sends in these spies. Now, he's not sending in spies like like the kind of spies he was the years before. These are spies not go to search out the land, but to strategically prepare for battle. How they they should enter, how they should move through the, the countries and take the promised land that God has given them. And so Joshua sends the spies as a kind of an advanced team to examine the upcoming battlefield of of Jericho in this case. As I said, they're not very good spies. If not for the providence of God, they would have been caught. And so God uses these these poor guys. I'm not trying to be too hard on the spies, right? This is all within the providence of God. And uh, in fact, I'll point out, my, my whole point is the reason they waited for three days on the east side of the Jordan is because God had a soul to save. The reason the spies got caught not just because they were not good spies, but because God had a soul to save. He had this divine meeting prepared. Rahab needed to be taken out of the Canaanites, brought into the fold of Israel because she had faith in the one true God. And so we're going to look at her faith. It's really a story of hope in the eternal promises of God to redeem sinners who deserve death but are given life. Rahab deserved death. And yet God gives her life. And so this is a story that relates well with you and I who are sinners in a pagan world with no potential for for mercy or for pardon. And so we're going to start by talking about this lost sinner Rahab. And we'll just read some portions. It's a longer passage, so we'll just read a portion at a time. So would you read starting in verse 1? Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from a taste of woe. I secretly saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And lodge there, and they told the king of the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight with the children of Israel to search out the country. And then bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. Where they uh, where they're from, and it happened that the gates were being shut, and it was dark. But the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, 
for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men of Jericho pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the ford, and as soon as those who pursued them saw that, they fled. So they were left with the rest of the I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Now what do you mean? Really says what the Lord is doing. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there, did there remain in any more courage of anyone to say to you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father and my mother and my brother, my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. I'm going to make some very quick observations. They're not very astute. They're obvious, right? Scripture tells us exactly who this woman is. There's debate because she's a, a, a harlot that some people say because she had a, a house on the wall and she's a harlot, the word could actually be interpreted that she's an innkeeper. Well, she is an innkeeper, a special kind of innkeeper. And, and it makes it clear. She is a prostitute. There's no doubt about it. She's a, uh, most likely a widow. A lot of people believe she would be a widow, but she is alone. She is a single woman, either married and widowed or never married. She has, think about that then, she has no power, right? She lives in a very pagan society where the men are very much in control and, and she has to make a living. And so I'm not at all, I'm not at all excusing her sin, not the sin of lying, not the sin of harlotry, but she's give, been given little chance. She has little control or power in her life and she's pretty much an insignificant woman and therefore Scripture says she is a harlot, possibly forced into it, maybe not, but she's been successful, I'll say that, she owns a house, she has her own fields, she has flax drying up on the roof of her, of her house, she has an income, she's providing for herself, and yet she is very much living a fleshly, sinful life. And on top of that, she's a Canaanite, unfamiliar with the law of God. Now, this is what's so important. God has, I do not, do not fall under the presumption that God is, is just mercilessly destroying the Canaanites and taking away their land and giving it to Israel. Israel was promised this land a long time ago. God has said, this is the land that I was leaving them and they were defeated. Before, even before they were taken away from Egypt, God has sent prophets into the land to proclaim the truth and the righteousness of God. Abraham was a righteous man. And God counted it to him for his righteousness. He was a man of faith. He demonstrated what it meant to be uh, faithful to God, to believe in the one true God. The, the people of the promised land, the, the Canaanites, the Amorites, uh, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all the ites, they've all had ample opportunity to come to Christ. God has used people through the years, hundreds of years, to give them the truth, but they've rejected it. God is not just sweeping in and absolutely erasing people, erasing society. On top of that, he has warned the people of the promised land to leave the promised land because it's not there. God chooses, in his sovereignty, who he's going to give it to, and he's going to give it to the Israelites. So he's given them a chance to escape, to leave. They haven't left. God is not unmerciful, up in heaven just waiting to destroy people. He has... He's even given opportunity to the inhabitants of the land to continue to live, just not in the promised land. And Rahab is going to choose a way to remain in the promised land, and that is by uniting with the one true God. And that's important. But she's unfamiliar with the law of God. She's not been given the Ten Commandments. The Israel has had the Ten Commandments for 39, 40 years, but these are not something they've been passing out, you know, flyers passing out to other nations. 
She's been raised in a pagan society without much information. She does not have the book of Genesis, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. She doesn't have those books. She can't sit down and read them. She cannot learn about God through them. Yet she knows what suffering is. She knows what injustice is. She knows what pain is. She's unfamiliar with the promises of God. She doesn't have the understanding that God is holy. No one has ever told her that there is only one God and He is a holy God. She's not heard about a, a promised Messiah. She doesn't have the privilege of, of knowing Genesis 3.16 and knowing how... Uh, maybe she knows about Abraham. I'll say this. Maybe she knows that God has blessed Abraham and made of him a nation. But it is unlikely that she has been schooled in uh, the path of God, the ways of the Lord, and yet she knows that she is on the losing side. She knows there's one true God, and she knows that he's in control of all things. And so God begins this work in her heart. I don't know when he began the work, but the work has come to fruition to this point where she's hiding spies up on her roof. They don't ask her, hey, by the way, before you cover us up, which God or whose side are you on? Which God are you following? They don't ask her. They don't say, hey, before, hold on, don't cover us up. If we're going to die in the next five minutes, I need to know, and you need to know that God's going to send a promised redeemer, and you need to repent of your sins and follow that Christ. Like it's a, pra a plane going down or something. No, no, no. They're not even concerned with giving her the gospel. They're just concerned with being hidden. And yet she says to them, I am following your God. I know there is one true God. She is never asked, according to Scripture here, there's no indication she's ever asked about her faith. She goes out of her way to tell them who she is trusting. And that, that is a great message. And, and sometimes it's easy to forget. God does not want us to miss this point. There is incredible power in the message of God. And so look at how he's already been working. In verse 10, it says, For we have heard, so she's just speaking. This is, she, she can't read a Bible. I'm not saying she can't read, but she, ha, she does not have a Bible to read. And yet she has heard of the actions of the one true God. Verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the river of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth below. What a statement that is. There is one sovereign Lord one ultimate king, one ruler, and it's not the gods that we've been serving on this side of the Jordan. It is your God, the one who's been leading you, the Shekinah glory, Jehovah God. He is the only God. I mean, that is a statement of faith. And so she's heard, notice what she said, she heard what God did, and she has heard who God is. And so this is a message of faith. It's trust in God. Verse 12, she, she makes her, her stand. Here's what her faith is in, what, what she's already said. And then verse 12, she says, Now therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And so she pleads. For mercy. These two spies, it, it's not perfect faith. Because how can she have perfect faith? She doesn't even have full knowledge of God. So these two spies are her, her connection point to God. And so she says, plead for me. I beg you, please give me a token. Give me a, an assurance that you will not destroy my household. We are going to trust in you. And by the way, the, the statement is very clear. Whoever's going to hide with her in her home will live. And so she gathers her loved ones and she tells them about the one. By, I'm, this is implied. I, I get, I'm, I'm taking a, a, a step in faith here. 
by her gathering these people, she didn't trick them and say, hey, uh, we're going to have a little potluck at my house when you see, you know, day seven when those crazy Israelites start going around seven times around the city. That's your cue. Come get. She doesn't know. She doesn't know how long she's got to keep her family in her household because every day they show up and they march around and then they leave. But the promise has been made, or she's asked, the request has been made. They're going to give her the promise. And so Rahab has heard how God has miraculously provided for Israel. He's, she's heard how God has redeemed Israel and brought them out of slavery. She's heard how Israel failed to trust God, and yet they wander for 40 years, and in spite of that, God knew, and God was still faithful, and, and he's still faithful to Israel in spite of their failures. Now, let me ask you a question. A woman who is a harlot, and, and in a sense alone, I know she has a family here, but for a woman who is alone in life, struggling to get by, living a sinful life, she understands she needs a God who is merciful and kind and gracious. And that's what she's heard. Right? I don't know what else, I don't know what the Canaanites have heard. Maybe they've heard, that maybe they're led to believe that God is unmerciful. Right? He's going to steal. It's all about perspective in a sense. He's going to steal our land. They're going to take our stuff. They utterly destroyed the, the people on the other side of the Jordan. They're going to do that to us. They, their God is a God of vengeance and wrath and anger and hatred. And what did Rahab hear? She heard he's a God of mercy and a God of kindness, of tender leading. And she knows she needs that kind of a Savior. And so she pleads for God a God who redeems, a God who delivers. She needed a redeemer. She needed a deliverer. She believed what she heard about God, not what she saw. And so James chapter 2, verse 25 says this, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? And a lot of people like to skew that verse. Does that mean that she was saved by works in, in that herself? She was saved by the things she did? No. She's saved by the work of God. She trusted in God. She heard about the works of God. She trusts in the work of God. It's her faith in God that is demonstrated in her works. Was it not? She hid the spies. And this, is a, this is a great example of, of work gone wrong. Because she hides the spies, but she lies in the process. Multiple times, actually. She, multiple lies. Not one little white lie. Not a little gray. She outright, straight up lied multiple times. And yet God is gracious. Because she's trusting the one true God. She's doing it, in a sense, the wrong way. She's making mistakes along the way. But her faith is not in herself. It's in the Lord. And so James tells us her faith is demonstrated in her works. So she has sufficient faith to identify herself with the people of God. Now just think about that. She knew nothing of these two men. I have no doubt she's an innkeeper and that's why the two spies were there. I don't think they were participating in any sin being there. It was a place, a refuge, a place where lots of people go in and out. Men, mysterious men. It's a place to hide for them, and that's why they're there, and yet she knows nothing of these two men. She, don't know, she doesn't know if they can be trusted, and yet she trusts in their God. Now let's read the remaining port, part of the story, if, if you would. Verse 14, So the men answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours, it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Oh, I'm sorry, let me stop. Okay, They're making a promise. They have no clue how this is going to be filled, right? I mean, let's be honest. Joshua has no clue how they're going to take Jericho. Nobody has a clue how they're going to take, Jer take Jericho. And their method, their method of war warfare, can we at least say it's a bit unorthodox? Right? Marching around a city and blowing trumpets is not exactly how you win wars. And yet, they have no clue how God will deliver, but they know, these two spies know that God will deliver them because he's promised he would. And in faith, they're trusting him. And she's trusting 
God as well, and, and these two men. All right, let's pick back up, sorry. Verse 15. Then she let down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall, and she said to them, Get to the, to the mountains, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward you may go your way. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless, uh, and unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and your, all your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head, and if a hand is laid on him, and if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which you made us swear." Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went to the mountains and stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. The pursuers sought them all along the way, but did not find them. So the two men returned, descended from the mountain, and crossed over, and they came to, the, to Joshua, the son of Nun, listen to his words, and told him all that had befallen. They said to Joshua, truly, the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. Those are words Joshua said 40 years ago, right? The Lord is going to give us the land. So they're responding in faith. Israel is prepared. They're ready to go in. The time is now at hand. Now listen, we're going to talk about Jericho, the fall of Jericho, the next time I preach, which I can't really remember when that is. October 1st or 2nd, whatever Sunday. So we're going to get there. And it's exciting. And, and, and uh, I used to, you know, I picture things in my head. I picture like their Sunday school classroom flashcards. That's how I used to picture things, flashcards, you know. And, uh, and, and I always picture Jericho right next to the Jordan River. It's not. It's a long ways away, a couple miles off of the Jordan. The, the, this, the banks of the Jordan are, are relatively flat, and there's a floodplain that's uh, over a mile wide, and then a couple more miles beyond that uh, of more land that's flat. And then from that point, it is a steep cliff. Up, this is the part of the Great Rift Valley. So she's literally, and that's where, where Jericho is located, on the very western side of the Jordan River, the western side of the very edge, at the base of the cliffs that lead up to Jerusalem. It's, a, it's an extremely perilous pathway. Uh, I believe it's 17 miles, if I remember correctly, from Jericho all the way to Jerusalem, and it's thousands of miles of elevation change. It's, it's actually where the, the Good Samaritan Road is dangerous. So she's telling them, just go up from here, up into the mountains and hide. And that's exactly what they do. By the way, you can go to Jericho. You can see the walls of Jericho. We're going to talk about this. I'm trying to, I have a not very good picture of it. But you can literally see the walls of Jericho where they have fallen out, not in, but out, like God said. And you can, they've uncovered portions of the wall and you can see just the bricks laying sideways descending, falling down the hill. An incredible thing. You can go to a wall. There's only one section of the wall that's standing. And you guess whose it is? It's Rahab. It's, it's incredible just to see. I don't picture it in my, my kiddish mind anymore as just a flashcard. It's also miserably hot there, by the way. And so she knows nothing of these two men. She hides them commits to a vow with them, and we see the importance of her living faith. She is in desperate need, as we said. She's a harlot, she's a liar, and God loves to save sinners. He sends in these two spies just to find, they don't even know it, but he sends them in to find this woman, to deliver her, and to make her a part of God's redemptive story. Would you go to Matthew chapter 1 with me? Matthew 1 is a genealogy, right? We all love in our Bible reading when we get to genealogies. But they're really important. And I love this. Matthew is the gospel written to the Jews. Very Jewish 
and your Jewish lineage or heritage is passed on through the mother, not through the father. You're not Jewish if your mother's not Jewish. And so they've, they've passed on this lineage, although, yes, I realize there's, there's men listed in this. It's because the mother that the lineage occurs. We just read with me, starting at, at verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. Judah begat Perez and Zahar uh, by Tamar. So here, there, we have a woman listed, a sinful woman, also played the prostitute. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot uh, Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab. This is why it's so incredible. This is why it's about God's redemption. God takes this pagan Canaanite woman, a harlot, a sinner, and she becomes part of the line of Christ. She gets grafted in, to use New Testament terminology, grafted into Israel, made a part of Israel, and becomes the whatever, great-great-grandmother of the Messiah. God loves to save sinners. She also has living faith. She confessed her faith there in Joshua chapter 2. As I said, they didn't ask. They didn't try to evangelize or win her to Christ, tell her to join with God or die. They didn't say any of that. She is the one who sought the promises of God. And in faith, she hid them. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, she appears in the great faith chapter. Hebrews 11, verse 31. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. I mean, she did believe in the one true God. This is, this is so important. It's important for us to remember. We live in a very clean society, you know, generally speaking. We live in a very moral society, generally speaking. We live in a very comfortable society. And this woman, in her desperate need, turns to God. And we need to remember this. We're not clean. We too need redemption. And God has woven through history a scarlet cord. Really, this scarlet cord that she hangs out of her window, it's more than just a, a red thread or a red uh, thin rope. It represents God's redemption all through history. The blood payment that Christ would make, that was promised in Genesis 3, promised to Abraham, seen here through Rahab. She's made a part of this through the lineage of David all the way to being born of a virgin. This scarlet thread continued on into our life. And we need to remember that who we are, we are sinners in need of redemption and we serve a God who is in absolute sovereign control of all things. No sinner is too far. Think about that. He reaches into a pagan land to pull one soul out. Because every soul matters to Christ. And in faith, she trusted the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the life of Rahab and what it represents. Although none of us are broken in this way, we too have experienced at times disappointment, poor treatment. We too have found ourselves hurting, scared, uncertain about the future. Lord, this account wonderfully demonstrates that you are always in control. Never lose control. And so I pray in our faith we would respond we would respond to the, one, to the one Lord and ruler, the almighty King who never loses control, who has all things in order. And in spite of the chaos and the circumstances around us, we can turn to you, Christ. In spite of our sinfulness, 
and our own shortcomings, we can turn to you. And I pray we would do that, not just sal salvific, but in our daily walk, that we would learn to trust you more. May this account challenge our hearts. You are never out of, of earshot. You can always hear our prayers. And you know the details of our lives and you care intimately about them. And so we thank you for your love and your care and the grace that you've demonstrated to us. May we continue to proclaim your goodness to those in the pagan world around us. And we thank you. We thank you for this in Christ's precious name.